Introducing Wondersuite from Bluehost.com. Website creation is hard. Was hard, but not anymore. Thanks to Wondersuite from Bluehost. Answer a few questions about your business and goals, and the Wondersuite tool will automatically create your website or store. From there, you can customize your design, colors, and content, and we automatically help you get found in search engines like Google and Bing. From step-by-step guidance to suggested plugins, Bluehost makes WordPress wonderful for everyone. Go to bluehost.com slash wondersuite. A science story, huh? And I just thought, well, I figured it, out. it was that golden moment. Because science was on my side. Hey everyone, I'm Ben Lilly, and welcome to the Story Collider, where we bring you true stories of how science has affected people's lives. This week's story is from Alan Lightman. The story was recorded in September 2013 at the Middle East in Cambridge, Massachusetts. The theme of the evening was Poisons and Passions. I'm going to tell a rocket story. Ever since the launch of Sputnik in 1957, which was around my ninth birthday, I was uh, entranced with building a rocket ship of my own. I imagined the blast off. I imagined the beautiful curve of the trajectory through space. All of these things appealed to my poetic as well as my scientific uh, inclinations. So by the time I was uh, 13 years old, I was mixing my own rocket fuel. Uh, A fuel that burned too quickly would explode like a bomb. Didn't want that. And a fuel that burned too slowly would smolder like a barbecue grill. Um, I built the, the body of the rocket out of an aluminum tube. And to ignite the fuel... I used the flash bulb of a brownie camera. Now, this dates me. Do any of you remember brownie cameras? So the high heat of the bulb going off would ignite the fuel, and I could set off the bulb with thin wires trailing from the tail of the rocket to my battery and switch in my command bunker, a, a safe 100 yards away. Uh, I built the launching pad out of a Coca-Cola crate filled with concrete and anchoring an aluminum tube. For some reason, I got it in my head that I needed a passenger. (laughs) Uh, Unmanned space flight seemed just too routine. (laughs) So I built a capsule that I put in the nose, the top of the rocket, and I recruited a lizard to be my passenger and to ride in the capsule. Uh, I made a parachute out of silk handkerchiefs that I wound around the capsule, and uh, I figured that, that the capsule would be ejected at the highest point of the trajectory of the rocket by a, a small amount of gunpowder, And uh, a mercury switch and a small battery and a high-resistance wire. The mercury switch, which I was most proud of, um, was a sealed glass cylinder with two wire contacts at one end and a thimble full of mercury at the other. And I reasoned that when the rocket was at its highest point at apogee and it just started turning horizontal that the mercury would slide down the tube, would come between the two wire contacts, would complete an electrical circuit, the battery would heat up the high-resistant wire, which would, which would light the gunpowder, the capsule would blow out of the nose cone, the parachute would unfold, and the parachute and the lizard would f- float gracefully back to Earth. <laughs> So that was the plan. And um, 
I had it all figured out. I'd done lots of calculations and drawings. Well, the launch took place one Sunday at dawn on the ninth hole of the Ridgeway Golf Course in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, For spectators, I had my three younger brothers, and I also had a few 14-year-old friends from the neighborhood. Well, the launch was flawless. After the countdown, I closed the switch, the brownie flash bulb went off, the fuel ignited, the rocket shot from its pad, and a few seconds later at Apogee, the capsule came out, the parachute unfolded, and it all dropped back to earth. Uh, The spectators and I rushed over to see the capsule and the lizard. I'm not sure what we were expecting to find. (laughs) What we did find was that the lizard was A-OK, but its tail was burned off. Uh, At the base of its abdomen, there was just a black stump. And uh, in all of my calculations, I had neglected the fact that the lizard's tail hung down into the fuel chamber. <laughs> but this, this one aspect of the, lo- of the rocket launch, despite all of the many things that worked right, this one aspect of the burnt tail was considered most noteworthy by all of my friends. Well, um, after the burnt tail experience and after an, a number of similar experiences in college, I, <laughs> I realized that I was better suited to be a theorist than an experimentalist. So I, I started graduate school in physics at the California Institute of Technology, and I studied... Uh, general relativity, which is, which is Einstein's theory of gravity. Um, and I was very interested in black holes. Um, this was a very cool time to be interested in black holes. This was the early 1970s, and the first black hole in space had just been discovered, and there were a lot of new theoretical calculations dealing with black holes. So I was, I was very excited about this. Uh, The great physicist Richard Feynman was on the faculty of Caltech. Does anybody know Richard Feynman? So Feynman was uh, very interested in the new developments with black holes, and he used to go to lunch with us graduate students, a few of us who were working on black holes, to to find out what we were working on. And this was the way Feynman was. Um, He wanted to know everything new in physics, He didn't care where he learned it from, even from a few lowly graduate students. Uh, So he used to go to lunch with us. And one day we're at lunch with with Feynman, and a couple of my fellow graduate students are telling about a theoretical calculation they've just done in which light is shined at a spinning black hole, and it bounces off with more energy than it came in with. And uh, a good analogy of this is is throwing a marble at a spinning top. And if you throw the marble at the right angle, it will bounce off with more speed than it came in with, and the top will slow down a little bit. So Feynman is listening to to the two graduate students talk about shining light at a spinning black hole, and he says, that sounds exactly like stimulated emission. Now, this is really not as hard as it sounds. Um, Stimulated emission is a process in quantum physics. When a particle of light hits an atom and two particles of light come out, you get more energy out than went in. And a long time ago, Albert Einstein showed that whenever you have stimulated emission, you must also have something called spontaneous emission, which is emission of light by an isolated atom with no energy coming in. So Feynman says, if a black hole can do stimulated emission, it probably also does spontaneous emission. And at this time, uh, this was in the 
the early 1970s, people thought that nothing could come out of a black hole, that the gravity was just too strong, but nobody had taken into account quantum physics. So we're mulling over this possibility of spontaneous emission of black holes at lunch, and we finish lunch, and we walk out of the cafeteria, and we're kind of wandering aimlessly around campus, really engrossed with this physics problem, and we pass my office, and I suggest that we go in and continue the conversation in my office because I have a blackboard there, and physicists do most of their thinking at the blackboard, especially theoretical physics physicists. I also happen to have uh, an X-rated poster of Popeye and olive oil on the wall <laughs> n- n- next to the blackboard. But Feynman didn't pay any attention to this. He was so engrossed with the spontaneous emission of black holes. So he goes to the blackboard, and in about 20 minutes, he's written down all the math for the spontaneous emission of black holes. Um, all the equations, it's all there on the blackboard. And my fellow graduate students and I are sort of sitting down just watching Feynman calculate. Uh, we had a vague idea that this might be important, but we weren't sure. So Feynman finishes at the blackboard, and he claps his hands together to get the chalk dust off his hands and then walks out of the office. He's done. (laughs) He doesn't have any interest in telling anybody about the results or publishing. He, He just had the intellectual curiosity to know the answer to this problem, to see whether spontaneous emission of black holes was possible, and he's finished. He, so he, he leaves the office, um, And the other two graduate students, Bill Press and Saul Tukolsky, go back to their offices. Well, that night I get this kind of disturbing feeling that what Feynman did at my blackboard was was very important. Uh, The spontaneous emission of black holes and all the quantitative details all there on the blackboard. And so the next morning I hurry back to my office to copy down the equations on the blackboard. And I discover that the cleaning lady, the cleaning lady has come in during the night and she has washed the blackboard clean. It's all gone. This was 1973. And in 1974, Stephen Hawking published one of the most famous papers of his career on the spontaneous emission of black holes. (laughs) which is called Hawking Radiation. <laughs> so um, I guess if there's, a moral, if there's a moral to the stories, um, it's the equations by themselves are not enough. In the lizard story, um, all of my calculations omitted the, long, the, the poor lizard and, and his long tail. And in the black hole story, Feynman's brilliant equations were not accompanied by the ambition to publish. Thank you. That was Alan Lightman. Alan is a physicist, novelist, and essayist. He has served on the faculties of Harvard and MIT and was the first person at MIT to receive dual appointments in science and in the humanities. His novel, Einstein's Dreams, was an international bestseller, and his novel, The Diagnosis, was a finalist for the National Book Award in fiction. His latest novel is Mr. G, a story of the creation as told by God. The event was presented as part of the Conference on the Evolving Culture of Science Engagement and was generously sponsored by the Intel Corporation. For more science stories, take a look at storycollider.org, where we have archives of the podcast and upcoming events. The Story Collider is produced by me, Brian Weck, Darren Barker, and Ari Daniel Shapiro. The podcast is produced by Rose Eveleth. Additional help from Brooke Williams, Lena Groger, and Justin D'Ambrosio. The theme music is by Ghost. Special thanks to the Middle East for hosting the show, to Ben Weehy for tremendous help, and to my physics education for never getting close to a discovery like that, so I have no regrets. Thanks for listening. Everybody in your crew identifies as either Big Mac Burger, McNuggets, or McCrispy Sandwich. 
But you're the filet fish sandwich all day. That crispy fish, that savory tartar sauce, that melty cheese, that pillowy bun. Yeah, you get it. Every time. And if you love the filet of fish right now you can catch two of the classics you love for just $6. Limited time only. Price and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with any other offer. Single item at regular price. Ba-da-ba-ba-ba.